Bismillahirrahmanirrahim ve sallallahu ala seyyidina Muhammedin ve ala alihi ve sahbihi ve sellem. Tonight I would like to talk to you about the importance of culture and especially about the position of culture in Islamic civilization and Islamic law. And so what we're talking about, although it concerns us directly and the way we live now and what we do and what we want to do, it's very important to understand that this is a fundamental part of Islamic law. Um, from the time of the beginning of Islam until well into the pre-colonial period, Muslims were people who were extremely intelligent in working with the cultures of other people. They were not culturally predatory. They did not impose foreign cultures upon other people, but rather the people that they lived with or that they ruled or that they lived among, they always studied the cultures of those people, and they adopted from those cultures what was best. And this is a fundamental part of Islamic law. It's something that the Prophet taught us. One of the stories that we have um, from the life of the Prophet وسلم, was that one day in Medina, on the day of Eid, the day of the great festivity, there were Ethiopian Muslims who had come from Ethiopia and they were so happy that they began to dance with their spears and their drums in the mosque of the Prophet ﷺ. And this story is told to us in Bukhari and in other sources that Muslims regard to be highly authentic. So they were dancing in the mosque and they were using their swords and they were beating their drums. And Umar ibn al-Khattab, who didn't have that kind of a culture, uh, he wanted to stop them. And the Prophet وسلم, intervened and he said, leave them alone. Let them play their games. And in one transmission he said, let them play their games so that the Jews and the Christians know that there is no difficulty in this religion. And in fact, he watched them, and he took his wife Aisha, who wasn't able to see, and he put her up on his shoulders so that she could see and she could watch to her heart's content. So this is a very important precedent because it shows that he recognized the culture of the Ethiopians. And the fact that they had come into Islam, it did not mean that they had to become Arabs or that they had to give up their own cultural feelings and their own cultural expressions. In the early period of Islam, when the Muslims go into Byzantium and they fight with the Byzantines, we have the story of Amr ibn al-As, who was one of the great commanders there, as most of you know, and he's fighting against the Byzantines, and it's very, very difficult for him to do that. And so one of the companions comes up to him, and he says that um, the prophet said that the Rum, the Byzantines or the Westerners, would be the majority of mankind at the end of time. They would be the dominant people and the dominant culture at the an end of time. And um, it's very interesting. I want to read to you a translation of what Amr said, because again, um, and this is in Bukhari and Muslim, by, by the way, it shows us the fact that he is able to see the good that is in them. And he's able to see this, no doubt, because of the kind of training that he had received. And this is very important because 
His religion is not an identity religion. It's not one the nature of which is to otherize those that are not in his group. And so instead he can see the good that is in them. So when he hears this report, Amr responds and he said, if then what you have related is true, then know that the room, and we can say the Westerners because it also means that, I mean specifically the Byzantines, but he said, if what you say is true, then the Westerners, the Europeans, if you like, he said, know that they have four excellent qualities. And this is really beautiful, that he is able to evaluate them and to see the good that they have. And of course, then he's able to see what's good in their culture as well. So he said, they are the most forbearing of all people in times of discord. They are the quickest of people to recover from calamity or from defeat. They are the most likely of people to renew the attack after they have retreated. And they are the best of people toward the poor and the orphan and the widow and the weak. So this is really amazing. So he's able to, he knows this about them and he sees that. And then Amr thought about that a little and he said, and they have a fifth attribute which is both beautiful and excellent. They are the best of people in checking the oppression of their kings. So um, this is a reflection of the attitudes that these first Muslims had. And when they went out into the world, they were able to understand the people that they met. They were able to live with them. They were able to borrow from them. They were able to give to them. And this became a fundamental part of Islamic law. In Islamic law, we have maqasid, we have overriding principles, the protection of life, the protection of intellect, the protection of the family, the protection of sound religion, the protection of the economy, the protection of, the, of honor, and we also have what we call maxims, which are called qawa'id. And the maxims are general statements of the law that sum up what the law is all about. We have thousands of them, actually. But in Islamic law, we have five maxims which everyone accepts and which they regard also to be the very foundation of Islam. These are called al-qawa'id al-khams, al-kulliya, the five basic maxims. And the first of these is that things will be judged by their purposes. Al-umuru bi maqasidiha, things must be judged by their purposes. Like what is the purpose of the things that we do? And we have to be sure that whatever we do, we never miss the purpose. We don't be tied up in formalities. And another one is, certainty will not be removed by doubt. al yaqinu la yazulu bishak. And this is a principle of the intellect, that what we know for sure, we are not going to allow doubts to remove that. If we know something to be true, like for example, the excellence of your brother or your sister, then you're not going to allow a rumor to change your attitude towards them. We would have to have proof that is strong. And only certainty can remove the certainty. And then we say also, yuzal, that harm must be removed. Harm will never be regarded as normative. So a woman is not supposed to suffer through an abusive marriage. That's harm. And that harm has to be removed. And this would pertain to so many other types of harm. And we, saw, we say also, al-mashakkatu tajlibu taysir, that difficulty will bring facilitation. 
It is not the purpose of Islamic law to make your life difficult. And so wherever there is unnecessary difficult, difficulty, then the law will facilitate that. It will change, it will make it possible for you to breathe and to live. These are four of those maxims. And then there is a fifth maxim, which again is agreed on by all Muslim scholars. And that is the one we want to talk about tonight. And it is al-ada muhakkama. Al-adatu muhakkama. That good cultural convention has the power of law. Good cultural convention has the power of law. And that means that wherever we go, wherever we are, we meet with different cultures. We meet with different peoples. And just like Amr was able to look at his enemy, the Byzantines, and to say, but they have five excellent qualities. So we also must do that. And we're not talking about our enemies. We're talking about the people that we live among as neighbors. And you must be able to see that this is good, this is good, this is excellent, this is beautiful. And whatever is good, you must accept. And we have rules for that. So we don't give up our principles. We don't give up our truths. But the other things, which are the beautiful aspects of those cultures, these we have to honor. And in fact, we regard them to have the power of law. And I'm going to read to you some of the texts of our jurists that pertain to that. But because of this cultural sensitivity and this intrinsic honor of other people, Islam was not culturally predatory. It was not a predator. It did not want to destroy the culture of any people that it ruled or that it spread among or that it visited. And it did not want to force them to be Arabs or to be Turks or to be anything else. Um, this is a truth of Islamic history and it sounds to us very strange today, doesn't it? Because in recent decades, we've had the development of culturally predatory expressions of Islam. And uh, these have no place in our tradition. And they are extremely harmful to us and to others. And for this reason, it's been said that when Islam spread in the world, it was like a crystal clear river. And a crystal clear river has no color, but it takes on the color of the bedrock that it flows over. So if the bedrock is green, if it were emerald, then the river looks green. If the bedrock is sandy, like the Niger River, then the river looks sandy. And if it's another color, it will take on that color. And for this reason, then when Islam was in China, and it still is in China, it looked Chinese, but it also looked like Islam. And when it was in Spain and Portugal, it looked Iberian, and it developed the Iberian ethos. And when it was in the Ottoman Empire, for example, it took on the characteristics of the overwhelmingly Armenian and Greek cultures that were there before. And this is the way Muslims did everywhere that they went. And it affected not just their architecture, it affected their food, their dress, and so forth. And again, so this way, as some scholars have said, Islam was able to spread its peacock's tail from east to west. One tail, just like one river. It's the same river. It's the same water. But the tail looks different in every place. And before we continue, I just want to show you a few slides. And I put these together, an assistant of mine put them together. And we did it very quickly. And we could have thousands of slides, actually. 
There are many things that I've forgotten, but let's take a look at these. What is that? That's Russia, isn't it? And couldn't you say that that's the logo of Russia? No? Oh, oh you, you jumped the gun. Okay. But this is, of course, St. Basil's Basilica in Red Square. And doesn't it look funny? I mean, I've always known it like it's really funky. And what is the background of this? Does anybody know? Um, our brother said it's a mosque. And actually, everything in it is a mosque except for the very top. That is something that Tsar uh, Ivan Grozny, Ivan the Terrible, that's what he built. Okay? But the rest of it is all the remnants of a great mosque. And that great mosque is the great mosque of Kazan. Kazan is a beautiful city in the middle Volga. And the Volga River was under Muslim control and Muslim habitation for over 300 years. And the dominant ethnic group that was in the Volga were the Tatars, who were a Turkic people, speak a language very close to Turkish. And, the, and again, we don't know what the Tatar mosques look like. We know what their little mosques look like. And their little mosques looked like Russian Orthodox churches. They imitated Russian Orthodox churches. I've seen them myself. But Ivan the Terrible, Grozny, he uh, destroyed all of the Jewamia. And he forced the Tatars to become Muslims, uh, to become Christians. And in fact, Catherine the Great, she would allow them to be Muslims again. And it's interesting that most of them went back to Islam. But Ivan the Terrible, when he destroyed Kazan, he said, take their mosque and take it apart. And then take it by bull cart, oxen cart, to Moscow, which is not really far away. And then build me a basilica. And he had Tatar architects do that. They were the best architects. So this was built by Tatars under his command. But it's very important because all the bricks, all of the designs, all the tiles, that was the great mosque of Kazan. What did it look like? I don't know. I can imagine what it looked like, but I don't know. But why would I bring this up? Because of the fact that these Tatars built something that was so beautiful in Russian eyes that Ivan Grozny wanted to make this his basilica. And this has become like the logo of Russia. So there's something about this, maybe we can say this without being overly romantic, that pleases the Russian soul. Okay? So it, it is in harmony with the Russian soul. And this is the way we were. This is the people that we, this is what we wanted to do. We don't want to offend the people. We want to honor the people that we live among. Um, I mentioned the story of this mosque. And those of us who are, Muslim, who are Muslims, maybe this makes us feel bad. And I have to tell you the story because I went to Kazan. And uh, I met the young imam there. Um, he was a beautiful man. Unfortunately, he's not alive anymore. He had a short life. But he took me through a museum. He showed me many things. And I said to him, tell me the truth. Is it true that St. Basil's Basilica is actually from the mosque of Kazan? And he said to me, we don't like to talk about this. He said, we don't like to talk about this. And I said, why? And he said, what is the value of bricks and tiles? Let them take the bricks and the tiles. We want to be friends with the Russians. We want to be neighbors with the Russians. So forget about that. And I told him that this is one of the biggest words of wisdom I've ever heard. 
Because when we study the past, always we encounter in the past things that are tragic on all sides. And we never want to be people of revenge. We never want to be people who want to get back. God has wisdom in what he did. But the reason why I want to show you this is because of the fact that it shows this cultural genius. And this should be you. This was the way we were. Let's look at something else. Oops. How do I get that centered? Does anybody know? Okay, I think I can do it like this. Again, we put this together. Um, you know what that is. That's Athens, Greece. That is the Parthenon, the temple of Athena. One of the most beautiful pieces of architecture in the world, without any doubt. Toynbee said the most perfect architecture in the world is the Parthenon and the Blue Mosque. So these are perfect. Okay, so the Ottoman Turks ruled Greece for hundreds of years. Uh, under Ottoman rule, Greece was 50% Muslim, 50% Christian. Turkey, Anatolia, was 50% Christian, 50% Turkish. It's not like it is today. Th this was that old world. It was very different. What is the significance of the Parthenon and the theme we're talking about? This was the Ottoman Jamia of Athens. The Ottoman Turks took the Parthenon and made that their central mosque in Athens. If you go there, you can see. You can still see the Arabic calligraphy and so forth. And in the days of the Ottoman Turks, the, uh, the Parthenon was intact, by the way. And they also repaired it, they strengthened it. But, again, this is cultural imperative. And did this offend the Greek Orthodox Church? No, because the Greek Orthodox Church looked upon this as a pagan structure, which it is. And so they did not want it. They, they, they appreciated it, they were proud of it, they knew it was beautiful, but when the Ottoman Turks asked them, can we use this as a mosque, then of course, why not? And in fact, it was destroyed in the War of Independence, the War of Greek Independence in the 19th century. But again, this to me is remarkable cultural genius. And this way you show the honor that you have for the Greeks, the honor of their past, and Islam among the Greeks always had a Greek component. If you go to Nicaea in Turkey today, most of the Turks that are in Nicaea, at least the ones I met, they are Greek Turks. And even their mosques, they have a different flavor. It's these, it looked that way to me, you know, than the other uh, Turkish mosques. They have, sort of, they have a different flavor. So, let's go on. Indonesia, um, here, this is a, an Indonesian mosque, and it is typical of the earliest Indonesian mosques, and many Indonesian mosques are like that. There could also be uh, uh, some other photos that are even a little bit better. Um, this is called a cosmic mountain. Okay, this is called a cosmic mountain. Indonesia was Hindu-Buddhist, and Indonesia had a rich, symbolic legacy of Hindu-Buddhist culture. So when Islam came into Indonesia, it built its mosques, and the same thing was true of what is today Malaysia, Malaya. They built their mosques on the pattern of the cosmic mountain. The cosmic mountain is four pillars, and then usually it has three levels. And often it will be open, this mosque is not, but it will be open so that it's cool. And again, they take the symbols of the sacred and they make them their own. This is not a Hindu-Buddhist temple. It's a mosque, but it is very compatible with Indonesia. It looks very beautiful to Indonesians. <coughs> 
Um, these are Javanese shadow puppets. Okay? Javanese, Javanese shadow puppets. And um, what do they have to do with our story? Uh, when Islam spread in Indonesia, it spread among rice peasants. And one of the greatest representatives of Islam in Indonesia was a great man. I love him very much. And I know his descendants. And his name was Kali Jaga. Kali Jaga, protector of the rivers. And he was a great saint. And his story is a very beautiful story. And I had a version of that story until I met his great, 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 great granddaughter. And she said, no, you're wrong about that, you're wrong about this. So I know his story better. It's a very beautiful story. But he is one of the main people who spread Islam in Indonesia. And he did jihad with puppets. So his jihad was with puppets. And he designed the Javanese puppet, shadow puppets. And in fact, in the beginning, he began to use uh, the typical traditional puppets. And again, th this is a Javanese puppet. This might not be, this is more like a traditional puppet. But the traditional puppets were, were, were patterned. And there was one of the saints whose name was Sunan Giri. And he was also great. And he's a contemporary of Kali Jaga. And he was using puppets. He said, no, you can't do that. You can't use these images. And so he said, OK. And so he came back and he designed the Javanese puppets. Again, my assistant picked these, and I have some better examples. But he created Javanese puppets that are very skinny. Some of these are that way. You see, like this. They're very skinny. And then he said, could these live? <laughs> and Sunan Giri said, no. He said, then I'll use these. And they're also more beautiful. And they're more Javanese. And then he made up beautiful stories. And he also took the gamelan music. Have any of you heard gamelan music? Uh, do you like it? It's like, we are not used to this song, but it's... That's right. You have to get used to it. Uh, I like it very much, but not in the beginning. <laughs> it's very different music. But he also took the gamelan music and he reinterpreted it. And he, def he redefined all the symbols. Green, white, one, two, bunyan trees, everything. For example, uh, before the sacred, the cosmic mountain, you'd often have two bunyan trees. Of course, bunyan trees are the trees under which the Buddha received his enlightenment. So they're very important in Buddhist culture. And usually between the palace and the mosque, or the temple, there would be two bunyan trees. So he said, two. Wherever you see two strings, two trees, bunyans, it means la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. It's the shahada. And he's really a beautiful man. He also taught the people new ways to raise rice. He helped them to raise their rice better. And you know, this was a peasant society, and it's an aristocracy. This is the way Indonesia and Malaysia and these countries were very class-oriented. Even in Japanese, you have a way, just like in German, you have Essen und Fressen, right? And in Japanese, you have Essen for a particular elite. You have a different type of verb for different classes, and you have a different word for the lower classes. It's caste language. But he was able to help the peasants farm better. And he was himself an aristocrat. You know, so he gave himself to the people, he talked, he, he used the music, he used the puppets. And again, he uses these cultural forms. And he has incredible stories that he tells with the puppet shows. And the puppeteer, and he made up stories about the encounter between Hamza and Vishnu, and the encounter between Shiva and Yusuf and things like that. He makes up stories. But in that, he's teaching morality. And most of the Indonesian peasants, until the colonial period and the post-colonial period, they learned Islam through puppet shows. They learned their values for puppet shows. 
and we'll go to India. And um, here I want to begin with um, this. This is a facsimile of a mosque. Actually, there's about 13 mosques like this. And uh, you can pick some different examples. This is said to be the oldest mosque in India. And it's in Kerala, which is a very beautiful part of India, on the western coast. That's where Islam first came to India. And that was you know, in the uh, late 7th, early 8th century. And I've seen many of these mosques. Again, this is in a museum. But um, here, the design is very beautiful for the region. And uh, my assistant could have picked some other ones as well. But some of the other ones are very clearly cosmic mountains. This one is not so clearly, it does have the cosmic mountain design, but not so clearly. Whereas a lot of the other ones are also that cosmic mountain, the four poles, you know, the, the, the three roofs and so forth. And, you know, so again, the, they are building a type of architecture that suits southern Indian culture. And it is not a rupture or a break with the traditions that are there. And those of you who know about uh, the subcontinent, you know that there's a huge cultural difference between the North and the South. And now, and they respected the South with this type of architecture. Now I want to go to the Taj Mahal. This is, of course, a completely different, this is the North. The North is very different. And even the Hindu temples of the North are very different. If you build the northern Hindu temple in the south, which Hindus often do today, it jars with the culture. It's a very different culture. But in the north, of course, you develop this kind of architecture. This is the Taj Mahal. All of you know that. And it is a beautiful synthesis of Central Asian elements, Persian elements, and also Indic elements. And again, I just want to pick it. We'll look at some other pictures because they're so beautiful. That um, what the Mughals did in building this, and of course the mosques they built, the beautiful architecture they built, the cities they built, um, is that they found a medium that pleased everyone. To the extent that just as St. Basil's Basilica is like the logo of Russia. This is like the logo of India, isn't it? And Indians are proud of this, and who wouldn't be proud of it? But again, it, it is tapping into the cultural ethos you know, of the Mughal Empire, and of the Hindus, and the Jains, and also the Christians, the ancient Christians who were there, and others. And, it, and it's something that is just remarkably beauty, beautiful. And in Islam, many of us believe that architecture is the supremest form of art. You know, beauty is the splendor of truth. Beauty is very, very important in our culture and in all cultures. And the more that you have truth, the more that you will have beauty. But, um, you know, the beauty that is here is just spectacular. How many of you have been to the Taj Mahal? I had the honor to go to the Taj Mahal. My friend who took me there, he said, we were going to many places in India, and he said, we go to the Taj Mahal on the night of the full moon. And we went there on the night of the full moon. I couldn't leave. And uh, it is one of the most, and in the daytime, it's incredibly beautiful. And there are other buildings there that you may not know about. And I told him, it's all moving. Can't you see that? It's all moving. And it's, and another thing about it as well, and we're not here to talk about architecture, but beautiful architecture is tectonic. Who knows what tectonic means? That's a difficult word. Tectonic, very important word. It means it fits the earth. It fits the earth. And Islamic architecture was always tectonic. Meaning, and I could give you examples of that. So it doesn't just respect the culture, it respects the mountains and the streams, and, and it fits in the earth. And this is incredibly beautiful, isn't it? But modern architecture, and of course there are beautiful types of modern architecture, but 
the type of modern architecture which is not especially beautiful, it's not tectonic. It doesn't fit the earth. And I would say it's saying, here am I. Look at me. Whether I'm ugly or beautiful, look at me. And this architecture, is it saying, look at me? Maybe you think it says that, but when you're there, you look at the heavens, and you look at the earth, and you look at the river. And in the full moon, you can't believe the whole thing moves. So it is perfectly tectonic. And it is an architectural wonder. But then also, it is extremely culturally sensitive. Um, when I was there uh, in Agra, these, these are also other pictures. These, these are other mosques. This is, these are, um, that's the Taj Mahal. And this is, I think, this is one of the buildings that is on the side of the Taj Mahal. And that's actually a mosque. But um, when I was there, um, we also went to other buildings. And uh, we went to the tomb of Akbar. Uh, Akbar was one of the greatest emperors of the, uh, of the Mughal Empire. Um, I happen to like Akbar very much. Um, it has been said that the mistake of Akbar was that he didn't have Shaykh al-Islam, um, Abu Mas'ud Effendi. Because Suleiman the Magnificent, Suleiman of Qanuni, he had Shaykh al-Islam, uh, Abu Mas'ud. And if you know the history of the Ottoman Empire, this Shaykh al-Islam was extremely important because he got the ulama behind Suleiman in everything he did. And therefore, Suleiman was able to do brilliant things. Because always in Islam, you have tension between the ulama and between the leaders. And Akbar didn't have that. But I went to Akbar's tomb, which is also very beautiful. And when you go in, you walk on this brick sidewalk, which is about, I would say, maybe two meters off the ground. And then on the right, there is grass. On the left, there is grass. And you have these beautiful gazelles. Beautiful gazelles. They're little gazelles. You have one breed on this side, another breed on the other. They've been there for generations. And um, your heart melts. And of course, they're, they're, they're tame. Nobody bothers them. So again, beautiful architecture. Beautiful architecture. And also something that fits into the culture and beautifies the culture. So here we come to China. And Islam came to China um, very early, from at least the 8th century. Some would say even the 7th century. And it develops through different stages. I wrote a paper called Sikh Knowledge in China, and it will talk about the Chinese Muslims. And they're very important for us um, because of the fact that Chinese Muslims, they learned, they, they used Chinese culture with great um, deftness, with great ability. And um, they respected it. And um, even they spoke about Islam in a way that the Chinese could accept. Because if you know about the Chinese, they are the kingdom of Middle Earth. And foreigners, aliens, are always regarded to be outsiders. And so the Muslims of China did not want to be outsiders. They wanted to be insiders. And therefore, also, how do you say Islam in Chinese? If you say it, if you want to say Islam, they're going to say Yisilam. Yisilam. And then they will spell it with funny characters, and it's a good joke. Because, like, you could also read the characters, this is not Islam. And so what they did is they changed the name. Among themselves, they would say Islam. But they said, Qing Jian Jiao. Qing Jian Jiao. The religion of the real and the pure. Anything wrong with that? And in fact, they did that in all sorts of things. And I've taken Chinese into Chinese mosques. I've had guides that were non-Muslims. And they're amazed because they begin to read all of this. The primordial religion from the foundation of heaven. Qing Jian Jiao. And um, so here you see a Chinese mosque. And what you might note is, and if you know about China, you would know this, 
it is a royal mosque because Islam in China was a royal religion. It was a state religion. It was invited by the Tang dynasty. And the Muslims there, some were merchants and they did other things, but most of the Muslims there served the emperor. They were soldiers, they were administrators, and they were very important in China. So the emperor says, you can build this mosque, and you can use my colors, and you can use my stones, and you can use the dragon. And this is what they will do. And this is a northern Chinese mosque. Uh, in China, the Muslim culture um, is divided into north and south. South begins at the Yangtze River, which goes through Shanghai. And you'll see there's a different culture in the south than there is in the north. But this is very northern. This is a royal mosque. Okay, I went to one of the mosques um, in Western, in Western China, and um, you know the mosque is absolutely beautiful. And one of the things about the Chinese is that they always built women's mosques. And um, so here you have a beautiful stone mosque, which has all the royal colors. But the Chinese emperor would not endorse a woman's mosque. So they made the woman's mosque from wood. They carved it from wood, which is beautiful. And then they had to stain the wood. They can't even paint it, because the colors have symbolic meaning. But also the wooden mosque was very beautiful. So, and he, here again, you have the garden. Uh, when you go to the mosque, you have to walk through the garden. The garden is based on Confucianist, Taoist principles. Um, it's sort of like a Zen garden, and it's supposed to remove your anxieties and your preoccupations. And then you go to the mosque, he's coming out of the mosque. Um, these mosques are hundreds of years old. They're extremely beautiful. And again, you don't have to be told. I mean, these are Chinese, but they're also Muslim. And there's no problem here. This is the crystal clear river that takes on the color of the stone that it flows over. I wish you could go there, and uh, when you go in their mosque, you don't want to come out. You don't want to go come out. Um, this is what? Anyone, anybody want to guess? What do you think that is? A minaret. A minaret. Does a mosque have to have a minaret? Benjamin? No. In fact, um, the minarets are really developed in Central Asia and in Iran, Persia. And what does the word minara mean, literally? Place of fire. And why would they call it that? Because they used to build bonfires on the minarets. Bonfires. Why would they do that? What do you think? So people could find the city at night, especially caravans coming out of the desert and coming overland. And so the minaret is actually built, especially for minarets and so forth, it's built usually for these bonfires that they would light at night so that people could see where the city was. Andalusian mosques didn't have minarets. They had a tower. This is also, the Chinese are like that as well. They don't need a minaret. Also, they're not allowed to build very high because uh, in Chinese culture, they don't like tall buildings. So that's about as tall as you could go. And you can't go higher than the emperor's palace. These are other beautiful pictures of the Chinese mosques. My assistant really did a good job here. <laughs> and now we come to, well, let me see here. Yeah, so now this is um, in Shanghai. This is a beautiful mosque in Shanghai. And it is about, I would say, um, 500 years old. And here you have a different culture. And here they use different colors and they use different materials. And they love red, black, and white. And this is one of the most beautiful mosques I've ever seen. It's uh, the Songjiang Mosque in Shanghai. Uh, this is the outside of it. And um, 
you can't really tell. Of course, you've got the symbols of the emperor, but actually in this mosque you have a big black dragon that goes on the top of the wall all around the mosque. A big black dragon. And what does that mean? It means this is the emperor's mosque. So woe be to you if you violate it. Don't steal, don't rob, don't climb the wall. Respect this mosque because it's the emperor's. And again, this is the way Islam was in China. It was endorsed by the emperor. And here again you have um, another picture of that same mosque. It's so beautiful. And when we went there, we, we just didn't want to come out. And then again, you see the Arabic script. And the Chinese developed the Arabic script over more than a millennium. And they develop it with a certain Chinese taste. And they develop it also to be written with a brush. Uh, although also they will use pen. They will use the, the same pen that we use in um, the rest of the Muslim world. And here I want to show you this as well, because this is typical of Chinese Muslim culture. Um, that is, of course, Arabic script. La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. It is a Chinese version of Arabic script. It's not difficult to read. And they will do it in a single stroke. They don't like to raise the pin. They might here raise it two or three times, but they like to do it just like that. And then they do the calligraphy as well. And the calligraphy is classical Chinese calligraphy, uh, which will tell people about that. What does that mean? What is the significance of it? And then the, the, the artist is authorized. Uh, he's got his name here, Muhammad. And then he has his stamp. So again, they are cultivating Chinese calligraphy, which is a sacred art and also China, uh, Arabic calligraphy, which they also regard to be a sacred art. Um, we look at Turkey a little bit. Um, you know, I just, I like this photograph, and those of you who've been to the Muslim world, you've seen things that are like this. Beautiful. And, you know, this is not so much a cultural statement, it is a cultural statement, but tectonic architecture. Look how it fits the mountain. Look how it fits into nature. And again, just like the Taj Mahal, does it say, look at me? Maybe you think it does. But I would say it says, look at me, but look at the heavens. Look at the earth. Look at the rivers. And here it's like, look at the mountains. Look at the sky. And of course you said, but this is so beautiful. It's so warm. It's so inviting. But it's fitting perfectly into the natural environment. Um, here we have, of course, the tomb of Rumi in Konya. And um, as you know, this is pre-Ottoman. This goes back to the Seljuk period. It is a beautiful example of architecture. But this, the Seljuk architecture, is architecture that essentially imitates the Armenian church. And... Um, at that time, uh, the Armenians are the significant Christian minority uh, living among Muslims. The Greek Orthodox are also there, but um, they're in a state of war. And therefore, the uh, Seljuks, when they build this, and most Seljuk architecture, I might be wrong, but it actually imitates uh, Armenian style. And even uh, this dome that is on Rumi's tomb, that is like Armenian. It is, of course, Muslim, and it's their own style, but uh, you can compare. And this, for example, I asked my assistant to get me an Armenian church, and so he came up with this one. But you can see the similarity, can't you? This is an Armenian church. And, you know, so that style of the Seljuk mosque it is one that is compatible with the Armenian churches. And the Armenians were called the faithful group, the faithful minority in the Ottoman. In Ottoman. They were highly respected, and they had very good relations with the Ottomans. And here, of course, you see these great Ottoman mosques, you know, which you will see throughout uh, Turkey and the Ottoman Empire. 
And uh, there's no question about their beauty, but what are they imitating? What are they consciously imitating? The Greek Orthodox Church, Hagia Sophia, and the Greek Orthodox Churches that come out of that tradition. And they did that consciously. And of course, that's not a Greek Orthodox Church, and you're not going to mistake it for a Greek Orthodox Church. But nevertheless, it respects the sacred tradition of where it's built. And it reflects a different approach to that, a different interpretation of that. And this is Hagia Sophia. And as you know, this was a great Christian church. It is one of the first great Christian churches ever to be built. And this will become the standard um, which all of the Greek Orthodox churches and the Russian Orthodox churches will follow. And so the Ottomans have that in mind. And what they build will be like Hagia Sophia. This is inside. Uh, here we go quickly to West Africa. We talked about going from east to west. And in the empire of Mali, which, by the way, was uh, the wealthiest empire in the world in its time. It controlled the gold markets of the world. Um, it uh, was, had global reach. The soldiers of the empire of Mali, um, as you may have heard me say yesterday, wore Persian brocade. And they used seashells for small coin. And the seashells they used came from the, from the Maldive Islands of the Indian Ocean. But they would go to pilgrimage, and they would commission architects to come to build in West Africa. And in one case, uh, the king, Mansa Khan Khan Musa, he brought back Andalusian architects, and he said, build me mosques. But he said, not Andalusian mosques. I want African mosques. And I want mosques that fit here. And so this is what they came up with. And no doubt they used you know, indigenous traditions and so forth. They build from adobe. The mosques are cool in the summer. They're warm in the winter. And uh, this is another example of that. Here you have another picture. And now we're going to end. I, I've taken a lot of time, haven't I? And, okay. We, we're, okay. But here... Um, one of my friends in Canada uh, is a professional weaver. And you know, so I wanted to show you her work. And what she wanted to do was to weave a Canadian prayer rug that puts in it the symbols of the First Nations and the colors of the First Nations. So this is actually what she's doing in that. And so she, she wanted something which she hoped would be pleasing to the First Nations, the Indians you know, of Canada, and then also to the Canadians. Uh, this is also a Canadian mosque, and um, it has won awards because of the way that it fits into the landscape. Um, and then also the woodwork in this mosque is woodwork that is based on of First Nations on the, and in fact, the workers who built the mosque are mostly First Nations, American Indians. And they were very happy and very pleased by that. So um, I think this is a very good precedent. And um, the Canadians actually have done a number of things like this that I am very supportive of. Um, this is one of my great friends, Azim Ibrahim. And um, these are Scots. These are Scottish Muslims who speak with Scottish accents. And um, they're wearing tartans. And I have a tartan, which is the Armstrong clan. I'm very proud of that. That was my great-grandmother's clan. But what clan is that? Is that a McGregor? Is that a Bennett? Is that an Armstrong? Anybody know that clan? Of course, this is Germany, a long way away from Scotland. That's the Muslim clan. And so, this is a Muslim tartan, authorized by the Scottish Parliament. And the, Scot the Scottish Parliament has 
a very good relationship with its Muslims, by the way. And I, I have a great respect for the Scots, because they are very open-minded with the Muslims. And so this tartan was de designed, and it's specially authorized. Here's a close-up. Blue represents the Scottish flag. Green represents Islam. The five white lines represent the five pillars. The six gold lines represent the five pillars of faith. And the black square represents the Kaaba. So that's beautiful. And uh, I really applaud our brothers and sisters for these kinds of steps. And there's so much more that we want to do and that we can do, bi'ithnillahi ta'ala. And that's the end of the slides. And welcome to Dr. Hibba. I'm happy to see you. So, um, I think that we can complete uh, what we're talking about in just a few minutes. And I just would like to give you a few quotations. Um, this is a quotation from, and in fact, I have a beautiful quotation from Abu Yusuf. Uh, Abu Yusuf is, uh, as you know, one of the greatest of the Hanafi scholars, one of the founders of the Hanafi school. And um, Abu Yusuf understood very well, as did the fuqaha, that much of what became the Prophet's sunnah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, was acceptable pre-Islamic custom. And we know this. All of us who study Islamic law, we know that. We know that certain things were pre-Islamic custom and the Prophet accepted them. And that also indicates an openness to cultures. So the Prophet ﷺ, he didn't come to destroy pre-Islamic culture. He came to purify it and to take from it everything that was good. A lot of that being Abrahamic. And um, so Abu Yusuf understood that the recognition of good local cultural no norms falls under the sunnah. This is Abu Yusuf. That when you go out into other cultures and you see what is good there and you respect it and you adopt it and you can modify it, you can make it your own. That's usually what we do. We try to make it even more beautiful but that that is the sunnah of the Prophet. And this is the wisdom that our scholars have. As Sarakhsi, whom you know is one of the great Hanafi legal scholars, As Sarakhsi emphasized what Abu Yusuf said about culture. And As Sarakhsi says, whatever is established by sound custom, Good custom is equally well established by sound legal proof. There's no problem here. Whenever you see something that is good, you accept it. And that has the power of Islamic law behind it. As Abu Yusuf said, that's the sunnah. We take from the good cultures of the people around us. Um, if you wanted to study this further, um, in the Qur'an, chapter 7, verse 191, God says, Accept from the people what comes naturally. He says, Take from the people what comes naturally for them. Command what is ma'ruf, customarily good. And turn away from the ignorant without respond, responding in kind. Don't re respond to the ignorant with ignorance. And this verse... Um, you know, is regarded to be one of the proofs of urf and ada, of the importance of good culture. Ibn Atiyah, who is a great Andalusian scholar, um, he says that this verse uh, upholds the sanctity of indigenous culture and grants sweeping validity to everything that the human heart regards as sound and beneficial, and he means the sound human heart. 
the healthy human heart, the enlightened human heart, as long as it is not clearly repudiated in the revealed law. So we, all, we don't want to break our principles. We want to keep our principles. But nevertheless, all that goes with that, we accept and we use. And um, let's look at, take some more quotations. Uh, there's a great Maliki judge of Baghdad called Abdul Wahhab al-Baghdadi. He's one of the great legal authorities of the Maliki school. Um, he said, the rejection of cultural usage, the rejection of good culture, has no meaning at all. It's absurd. If you live among Germans and you're German, you have to accept the good things they do. If you reject that, there's no meaning to that. Don't think that's piety. It's not piety. The rejection of cultural usage, usage, we can say good cultural usage, has no meaning at all. To follow sound custom is an obligation. It is a legal obligation. Ash-Shatabi, who is also one of the great jurists of Islamic history, of Granada, he says um, that uh, to make any judgment contrary to the norms of the established culture is juristic incompetence. Any judge, any mufti who makes decisions that fly in the face of good local culture, he says they are incompetent. They are not worthy of ruling. You have to make judgments that are in harmony with good local customs and conventional usage. And he says that the art of handing down legal judgments is that it must be in harmony with the good legal, the good cultural norms of the people of that area, because these good cultural norms are always consistent with the maslaha. They are always consistent with you know, the, 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 the needs of the people. At Tasuli, who is another great judge, he says, allowing the people to follow their customs, their usages, and general aspirations in life. And again, he means their good usages. Allowing the people to follow their good customs and usages and general aspirations in life is obligatory. They, they all, are, all are saying this. To hand down rulings in opposition to this is gross deviation and tyranny. And then we could go on and on. But this is very, very important. Um, I think we should conclude here. How much time do we have, please? We have uh, 30 minutes. 30 minutes. So we try to have questions. I'd just like to say a couple of things briefly. And first of all, we have another maxim in Islamic law. And these maxims are extremely valuable, extremely useful. And it says, that cultural usage, cultural convention is second nature. What does that mean? This is simply an acknowledgement by the jurists that when people have cultural conventions, those cultural conventions are as deeply instilled in them as their psychological, biological natures. And that means be wise. Because here we also have to emphasize that culture is not necessarily good. And that's why we have to be critical and we have to be wise in the way that we look at culture. And also our cultures that we bring with us from the Muslim world, they are not always healthy. And often they may have things in them that were healthy at one time, in one setting. But as the times change, they cease to be healthy. And for this reason, we have to always keep an eye on culture. We're not naive and just say, well, anything goes. No. But just as we have to accept 
good cultural no norms and build on them, we have to also be careful about bad cultural no norms among ourselves and among others. And especially we have to understand that when you want to change cultural norms, this is very difficult to do. You already have your culture, and your culture is one that is in harmony with this country, those of you that I know. You all speak German beautifully, and so forth. But, you know, to develop a dynamic culture that's actually in harmony with this culture, that's not going to be easy to do. It's very difficult to make the changes, and you don't want to make mistakes, you want to do it right. But we have to understand that even when we're working with a culture that is not healthy, that you have to be wise in how you do that. It's very difficult to do. And I want to end here, you know, with a statement about identity religion. And I think you know what I'm talking about. And identity religion is a term that we use today for people who use their religious identity, they can be Muslims, they can be Christians, they can be Jews, they can be Hindus. They're usually extreme, and they use their religious identity to empower themselves against the other. So always in, religious, in, in religion of personal identity, um, the other is demonized. And we have in the Muslim world today ideologies, you know about those or some of them, and this is what they do. They demonize all others, Muslims, Christians, Jews, everyone who is other than them, and this is a psychological or social, social psychological problem that we find very common in modernity. We find it among Christians and Jews and Muslims and Hindus and others. And um, the important thing is that Islam never was an identity religion. That doesn't mean that it doesn't give you an identity, yes. But this is not the only thing that it's for. And no religious tradition has any meaning if it makes you arrogant and proud and haughty. So, this cultural aspect of Islam, this is also part of it, that we don't want identity religion. Um, in my article, Islam and the Cultural Imperative, I talk a little bit about being culturally predatory, and I'll end with this. I hope I give you enough time to speak. But um, you know, in the history of Spain, you have the phenomenon phenomenon of the Hidalgo, the Hidalgo. And if you want to read about that, there is a great Mexican historian of Spain, Américo Castro. Américo Castro, he's a great historian. And you can read what he writes about the Hidalgo. The Hidalgo was identity religion. And the Hidalgo is Don Quixote, which is one of the greatest books ever written is about what? Don Quixote, El Hidalgo de la Mancha. Don Quixote, the Hidalgo of la Mancha. And this book is an incredible critique of the Hidalgo mentality. And, you, you know, it's one of the greatest books ever written. Um, I believe that it's a book about religious fanaticism. And the message of the book is that religious fanaticism is insane. And of course, if you've read the book, you know that at the end of his life, Don Quixote becomes sane. And all of his friends become insane. They all become like he was. But the Hidalgo mentality, we don't want. And the Hidalgo mentality was genocidal. And all of these ideas that demonize the other, they are potentially genocidal. And in the Hidalgo mentality, I don't have to be anything the Hidalgo is hijo de algo, he is the son of something, meaning he is the son of his military actions. That's what it came from. So he's lower nobility. The Hidalgos are not born into aristocracy. 
They earn lower nobility because they're valiant in war. He is hijo de algo. He did something. He did many things. And so the king will raise him up and make him lower uh, aristocracy. But the Hidalgo, their mentality, and I'm not making this up, please read Américo Castro, he's really good in this, that the Hidalgo, his worth is that he's not you, and that he's not a Jew, and he's not a Muslim. And, he and of course, he's good at war, yes. He's good at things like that. But he doesn't have to be anything, just not to be you. And um, this is what we don't want to be. And we have a lot of Hidalgos among us today. And there are a lot of Hidalgos in the alt-right. And there are a lot of Hidalgos in other types of culture.